cardiac cycle. Mechanical physiology refers to the actual process by which blood fills the cardiac chambers and is pumped out of them. Cardiac muscle cells contract as a unit to produce a coordinated contraction known as a heartbeat. Muscle cells are arranged in a spiral pattern generating a ringing action in the heart when it squeezes. Pressure changes caused by contractions drive blood through the heart with valves preventing backflow. The sequence of events that takes place within the heart from one heartbeat to the next is the cardiac cycle. Blood flows in response to differences in pressure from high to low pressure. As the ventricles contract and relax, pressure in the chambers changes and this causes blood to push on valves and either open or close them. When the ventricles contract, their pressures rise above those in the right and left atria and in the pulmonary trunk and aorta. And this causes blood to flow from the ventricles to the vessels and to produce two changes in the valves. Both of the AV valves are forced shut by blood pushing against them and both of the semilunar valves are forced open by the outgoing blood. When the ventricles relax, the opposite occurs. The pressure in the ventricles falls below those in the atria and in the pulmonary trunk and aorta. Higher pressure in the atria forces the AV valves open and allows blood to drain from the atria into the relaxed ventricles. Higher pressures in the pulmonary trunk and aorta push the cusps of the semilunar valves closed. And so you can see the pressure differential here. A stethoscope is a device that can be used to listen to the rhythmic heart sounds. Under normal conditions, blood flows through the open AV and semilunar valves relatively quietly. These sounds occur only as the valves close. Sounds that are not due to actual valves slamming shut are the result of vibrations of the ventricular chambers and the blood vessel walls. There are two heart sounds, S1 known as LUB, is heard when the AV valves close, and S2, known as dub, is heard when the semilunar valves close. S1 is typically longer and louder than S2, although it's lower in frequency. And what you're looking at here are where you can place the stethoscope in order to hear each of these valve sounds. And most of these locations are... The heart valve sounds can be heard by placing the stethoscope at certain locations relative to the sternum you can hear the aortic semilunar valve placing it between the second and third ribs on the right lateral side of the rib cage near the sternum. The pulmonary semilunar valve can be heard in the same location on the left hand side of the sternum between the second and third ribs. The mitral valve is going to be heard between the sixth and seventh ribs lateral to the apex of the heart on the left hand side of the rib cage <coughs> while the tricuspid valve <coughs> is going to be heard right over the apex of the heart just to the left of the xiphoid process between the sixth and seventh ribs. Again what do these sounds indicate? The opening and closing of the valves that ensure one-way flow of blood through the heart. Each cardiac cycle consists of one period of relaxation known as diastole and one of contraction called systole. The atrial and ventricular diastoles and systoles occur at different times as a result of AV node delay, but both sides of the heart are working to pump blood into their respective circuits at the same time, and under normal conditions that volume of blood is equal. The cycle is split into four main phases that are defined by the actions of the ventricles and the positions of the valves filling, contraction, ejection, and relaxation. The ventricular filling phase of the cardiac cycle is the period during which blood drains from the atria into the ventricles. The pressure from the left and right ventricles is lower than in the atria, the pulmonary trunk, and the aorta. Higher pressures in the pulmonary trunk and aorta cause the semilunar valves to be closed, and this prevents the flow of blood from the pulmonary trunk and aorta back into the ventricles. The AV valves open because of higher atrial pressure. Blood flows down its pressure gradient from the atria into the ventricles. 80% of the total blood volume in the atria drains passively in this manner into the ventricles. Initially, the atria are in diastole, but as blood continues to drain into the ventricles, the pressure gradient gets smaller 
and the filling slows down. At this point, atrial systole takes place, and the contracting atria eject a variable volume of blood into the ventricles, as much as the remaining 20% of blood volume and as little as a few percent. At the end of atrial systole, each ventricle contracts, or I'm sorry, each ventricle contains about 120 mil of blood. This volume is known as end diastolic volume because of its ventricular volume at the end of ventricular diastole. At the beginning of ventricular systole, we see the shortest phase of the cardiac cycle known as isovolumetric contraction. Now the prefix iso means the same as. So throughout this cycle, the volume in the chamber will not change. Pressure in the ventricles rises rapidly as the ventricles begin to contract. The high pressure closes the AV valves and causes the S1 heart sound. Ventricular pressure is not yet high enough to push open the semilunar valves, so both sets of valves are closed and ventricular volume does not change, thus the term isovolumetric. At the beginning of the ventricular ejection phase, pressure in the ventricles rises to a level, level higher than that in the pulmonary trunk and aorta and pushes the semilunar valves open. The beginning of the ejection phase is marked by the rapid outflow of blood from the ventricles. As this phase continues, pressure in the pulmonary trunk and the aorta approaches that in the ventricles and at this point, ejection of the blood vessels into the blood vessels decreases considerably. Ventricular ejection phase sees about 70 mil blood pumped in from each ventricle, which means that about 50 mil blood remains in each ventricle, a volume known as the end systolic volume. Now, it's very important to point out that during the cardiac cycle, none of the chambers are ever absent blood, i.e. absent fluid. If they were, the pumping action would cease. Okay, um, It's just that the volume of fluid in the chambers changes depending on whether the chambers are in systole or diastole. The final phase, known as isovolumetric relaxation, is very brief and it occurs as ventricular diastole begins and pressure declines in the ventricles. The semilunar valve snaps shut, at which point the S2 heart sound is heard. This happens because of backflow of blood against the semilunars that causes them to close. Now the reason that they don't evert into the ventricles is because of their shape. Their geometry is such that they're, they're cup-shaped with the, the indentations of the cup and the ridges of the cup facing outward towards the great vessels. The pressure in the ventricles is still somewhat higher than in the atria, so the AV valves remain closed at this point. Blood is neither is neither being ejected from or entering into the ventricles and their volume briefly remains constant, hence the term isovolumetric relaxation. So let's review the entire sequence of events here. Ventricular contraction causes the atrioventricular valves to close, which signals the beginning of ventricular systole. The semilunar valves were closed during the previous diastole and remain closed during this period. Continued ventricular contraction increases pressure in the ventricles above the pressure in the aorta and pulmonary trunk, causing the semilunar valves to open. When the ventricles relax and their pressures drop, blood flowing back toward the relaxed ventricles causes the semilunar valves to close which is the beginning of ventricular diastole. Note that the atrioventricular valves remain closed. When the pressure in the ventricles becomes lower than the pressure in the atria, the atrioventricular valves open and blood flows into the relaxed ventricles. This accounts for most of the ventricular filling. The atria then contract and complete the ventricular filling. Now this chart, which appears on the surface rather complex, actually shows you all the critical data that 
are relevant to the pumping action of the heart in one diagram. This is called the Wiggers diagram and what we can do is break down each part of the diagram piece by piece and the data gets a little bit easier to understand. If we look at the top we see an ECG. Okay, We already know the parts of the ECG and what they represent. right? The P wave which represents atrial depolarization the QRS complex which represents two electrical events ventricular depolarization and atrial repolarization and then the T wave out here which represents ventricular repolarization okay now what is important to note here okay is that there are important mechanical events that follow each of these electrical events and you can see them um, outlined here okay um, this next line here is simply showing you the heart sounds S1 and S2 S1 representing the shutting of the AV valves S2 the shutting of the semilunars and then let's go down to this bottom trace here and you're looking here at volume changes in the chambers of the heart. Specifically, you're looking at changes in the ventricular volume. So you can see here how the ventricular volume remains relatively steady until we get to the end of isovolumetric contraction and then we begin the period of ejection okay and at the period of ejection what do we see happening well we see the opening of the semilunar valves and the result is that the volume in these lower chambers is going to drop okay all the way down to the point where we reach and systolic volume okay and then at that point we're going to see isovolumetric relaxation that's this little green period right here okay very short and then we're going to see the opening of the atrioventricular valves and we'll begin then with the rapid inflow of blood into the lower chambers and they'll fill back up again okay so these three are rather straightforward okay gets a little more complicated in here what you're looking at in this top purple trace is the aortic pressure alright so the aortic pressure is the pressure in the great vessel that leads out of the left ventricle and so what you can see here is that we during the period of isovolumetric contraction see the pressure in this vessel slowly dropping okay and then what's going to happen here is during the period of ejection you're going to see the semilunar valves open and the pressure in these vessels is going to initially rise and then begin to fall again okay now why is this happening well the pressure is rising due to the rapid inflow of blood into the great vessels it begins to fall as a result of the blood flowing out of the vessel and into the smaller distributing arteries okay as it moves away from the aorta and towards the tissues and then what we see here is a little notch okay this is the area where the aortic valve closes and the blood flows backwards towards the semilunar valve and actually bounces off of it filling the coronary arteries and causing a brief uptick in the pressure in the aorta and then next thing that happens you're going to see the beginning of isovolumetric relaxation.
okay, followed by rapid inflow of blood from the atria into the ventricles. You can see now the cycle beginning to repeat itself again. <coughs> the pressure begins to fall, fall, fall until we repeat, okay? So that's what's going on in the aorta. What you're seeing here in this big trace down below, the green trace here, the one that goes like this, are the pressure changes in the ventricles, okay? And then this even smaller trace here are the pressure changes in the atria, okay? So probably most important is to look at the pressure changes here in the ventricles, and what we see are initially rather low pressures that rise slowly as we approach now isovolumetric contraction. What happens at isovolumetric contraction when it ensues is that the pressure in the ventricles rises quite a bit, okay, and that results in no change in the volume in the lower chambers, but a huge change in pressure, okay. At this point, both the AV and the semilunar valves are closed, and then as we begin to enter the period of ejection, all right, what you see is a a rise in the pressure in the ventricles, but then as the semilunar valves open, the pressure begins to go down and continues to go down, all right, until we get all the way back to the pressures that we saw during the period of ventricular filling, okay? So the filling brings the pressure up a bit, okay? Isovolumetric contraction sees a rapid rise in the pressure in the chamber, then the valves open, okay, the semilunars, out goes the blood, down goes the pressure, and then we see the ventricles refill on the back side of the cycle, okay? Remember that you can check the ventricular volume and what you'll see with the ventricular volume and the ventricular pressure is basically an inverse relationship. Most of the time when the ventricular volume is falling the ventricular pressure is going to be um, on the upkick, okay? And that's because as the container in which the blood sits is getting smaller, the pressures are growing up until the point where the valves open, okay? And you can see the volume continuing to go down here in the period of, of ejection. You see here an initial rise in the pressure in the ventricles, but that begins to fall midway through the cycle. And then as we get all the way down to end systolic volume, okay, you can see the pressures drop dramatically. So that's the breakdown of the Wiggers diagram. Study this because I can guarantee you you're going to see it either on the practical or on an exam. Okay, let's talk about how we regulate cardiac output. The heart undergoes an average of 60 to 80 cardiac cycles or beats per minute. This is known as the heart rate. It's one determinant of the cardiac output, which is the amount of blood pumped into the pulmonary and systemic circuits in a minute. The cardiac output is also determined by the amount of blood that's pumped in one heartbeat, known as the stroke volume. The stroke volume and the heart rate have to be known in order to calculate the cardiac output, which is the, the, um, the result of multiplying those two volumes, or those two those two measurements together. The stroke volume can be calculated by subtracting the amount of blood in the ventricle at the end of a contraction, the end systolic volume, from the amount of blood in the ventricle after it is filled during diastole, which is the end diastolic volume. So a way to determine how much blood the ventricles are kicking out is to subtract the ESV from the EDV, okay? The larger the EDV, the smaller the ESV, the greater the amount of blood being ejected by the heart. In an average heart, 
the resting stroke volume is equal to about 70 mil. So we can compute that by subtracting the EDV from the ESV to get our stroke volume. To find the cardiac output, you want to multiply the heart rate by the stroke volume. So at 72 beats per minute times 70 mil per beat, you get about 5 liters a minute, your cardiac output at rest. The resting cardiac output averages 5 liters a minute. The right ventricle pumps about 5 liters into the pulmonary circuit, the left ventricle pumping the same amount into the systemic circuit. Remember that they're working against different resistances, right? The right side of the heart works against much less resistance than the left side of the heart. Normal adult blood volume is about 5 liters, so the entire supply of blood passes through the heart each minute. Although stroke volume changes about 70 milliliters per beat, averages about 70 milliliters per beat, it can range anywhere from 50 to 120. The exact stroke volume can be difficult to measure directly, and often a measurement called the ejection fraction takes its place. <coughs> the ejection fraction is defined as the percent of blood that's ejected with each ventricular systole equal to the stroke volume divided by the EDV. The normal ejection fraction is about between 50 and 65 percent and this value should be equal for each ventricle. Three factors that influence stroke volume are preload, heart, cont heart contractility, and afterload. The relationship between preload and stroke volume is explained by the Frank Starling law of the heart. According to this law, increased ventricular muscle cell stretch leads to more forceful contraction. Stretching causes a more optimal overlap of actin and myosin filaments in the muscle cells and enables a stronger contraction and a higher stroke volume. This ensures that the volume of blood discharged from the heart is equal to the volume that enters it, particularly important during exercise when cardiac output has to meet the body. <coughs> the preload refers to the length or degree of stretch of sarcomeres in the ventricular cells prior to contraction. The degree of preload is determined by the end diastolic volume, which is the amount of blood that's drained into the ventricles by the end of the filling phase. Two factors that influence EDV are the length of time the ventricle spends in diastole and the amount of blood returning to the right ventricle from the systemic circuit known as venous return. EDV goes up when the ventricles spend more time in diastole <clears throat> because there's more time for them to fill with blood. It also rises when the left ventricle pumps blood more forcefully into the systemic circuit because additional blood returns to the right atrium more rapidly and this increases venous return. Contractility is the heart's intrinsic pumping power or the ability to generate tension. It's difficult to measure directly but it can be estimated by examining the velocity of blood ejected from the ventricles. Increasing contractility will increase stroke volume and decrease ESV. Decreasing contractility will do the opposite, decreasing stroke volume and increasing ESV, assuming that preload and afterload are constant. Stroke volume and heart rate generally increase together. Agents that affect contractility are known as ionotropic agents, and factors that increase heart rate, such as sympathetic nervous stimulation, often also affect contractility and increase the force of contraction. When the heart rate's too high, contractility decreases, as does preload, as the heart is beating too rapidly to develop significant tension during each contraction, a decrease in both stroke volume and cardiac output can take place. Afterload refers to the force that the right and left ventricles have to overcome to eject blood into their respective arteries. <clears throat> it's determined by blood pressure in the arteries of both the pulmonary and systemic circuits. As afterload goes up, ventricular pressure has to be greater to exceed the pressure in the arterial, pulmonary, and systemic circuits in order to open the semilunar valves. An increase in afterload as a result generally causes a decrease in stroke volume and so a rise in the end systolic volume of the ventricles. On the flip side, a decrease in the afterload corresponds to a higher stroke volume
and a lower end systolic volume. Note that a high preload leads to a high end diastolic volume and this volume of blood stretches the cardiac muscle cells combined with increased contractility this leads to a more forceful contraction. Since afterload is low this forceful contraction isn't pumping against a great deal of resistance. A forceful contraction against a low resistance leads to a high stroke volume and a low end systolic volume. Notice that low preload leads to a low end diastolic volume so cardiac muscle cells are less stretched and combined with a diminished contractility the heart contracts more weakly. Since afterload is high this weak contraction is pumping against a great deal of resistance. A weak contraction against a high resistance leads to low stroke volume and more blood left in the ventricle after contraction resulting in a high and systolic volume. Ventricular hypertrophy refers to the enlargement of the ventricles as a result of increased workload. Cardiac muscle cells of the ventricles need to generate more tension to continue pumping blood against a higher afterload. The cells respond the same way as skeletal muscle fibers by becoming thicker. As a result the walls of the heart are becoming more powerful. Right ventricular hypertrophy results from respiratory disease or high blood pressure in the pulmonary circuit increasing the resistance against which the right side of the heart has to push while left ventricular hypertrophy results from high blood pressure in the systemic circuit um, a condition that can be asked, exacerbated by conditions such as obesity. It can increase the effectiveness of the heart's pumping up to a certain point then the condition decreases the heart's lumen and thus reduces its filling space. This increases the risk for other cardiac conditions including heart failure. Other determinants of cardiac output include heart rate which under normal conditions the SA node governs at about 75 beats per minute. Factors that influence the rate at which the SA node depolarizes are called chronotropic agent. Anything that increases the rate at which this node fires is called a positive chronotropic agent and these include the sympathetic nervous system, hormones, and high body temperature. One with the opposite effect is known as a negative chronotropic agent and this includes parasympathetic nervous system innervation and reduced body temperature. Although the heart is autorhythmic it requires regulation to ensure the cardiac output meets the body's needs at all times. This is regulated by both the nervous and endocrine system which can influence both heart rate and stroke volume. There's two branches of the ANS that regulate our automatic functions. The role of the sympathetic ANS includes innervation of the heart through sympathetic nerves that stem from ganglia located along the spinal cord. These neurons release norepinephrine which increases cardiac output having both a positive chronotropic an ionotropic effect on the cardiac conduction system. Norepinephrine's positive chronotropic effect increases the heart rate at which the SA node fires up to 180 or 200 more times per minute and thus increases the entry of calcium ions into cardiac muscle cells. Higher calcium ion concentration increases the contractility of the cardiomyocytes which raises the stroke volume Together these effects dramatically increase the heart rate. Parasympathetic nervous system stimulation exerts essentially the opposite effect on the heart. It innervates the heart by the left and right vagus nerves which release acetylcholine and this primarily affects the SA node decreasing its rate of action potential generation. This negative chronotropic effect slows the heart rate and can even stop the heart temporarily if the parasympathetic stimulation is strong. Vagus nerves primarily innervate atrial muscle so they have less effect on ventricular contractility than on the heart rate and therefore have only weak negative ionotropic effects. Hormonal regulation of cardiac output occurs in various forms. The adrenal medulla is 
activated by the sympathetic nervous system and releases epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood. These hormones have the same effect as sympathetic nervous system neurotransmitter. They're positive ionotropic and chronotropic agents, but their effect is longer lasting than sympathetic stimulation. Other hormones that also have a positive ionotropic and chronotropic effect include thyroxine in T3 and glucagon from the pancreas. The amount of water is going to determine the blood volume and it plays a significant role in determining the heart's preload and its strength of contraction. Hormones like aldosterone and ADH increase blood volume and preload and raise cardiac output. ANP decreases blood volume and preload and reduces cardiac output. Other factors that influence cardiac output include the concentration of electrolytes in the ECF. This plays a role in determining the length and magnitude of an action potential in cardiac output. Body temperature also has an influence. The SA node fires more rapidly at high temperatures and more slowly at low ones. Age and physical fitness influence heart rate and cardiac output. Younger children and the elderly have higher resting heart rates, whereas trained athletes often have a much lower resting heart rate. Now you might wonder, why is that? And that has to do with the effect of exercise on the body's mass. Somebody who's in good physical shape is going to have a reduction in the amount of adipose tissue and an increase in the amount of lean muscle mass. The result is that instead of the blood vessels being longer, as they are in somebody who's obese, and likely narrower in diameter as a result of conditions like atherosclerosis <clears throat> and arteriosclerosis, the blood vessels are more numerous. The result is that the blood has more places to go with each pump of the heart. The result is that the load on the heart decreases because it's working against less pressure. So, paradoxically, somebody who's in good physical shape should have a heart rate that's low and slow. Exercise increases stroke volume, so for the body to maintain a constant cardiac output, the heart rate has to decrease. Heart failure is defined as any condition that reduces the heart's ability to function effectively as a pump. Causes of failure include reduced contractility due to myocardial ischemia or myocardial infarction, valvular heart disease, and any disease of cardiac muscle and electrolyte imbalance. Heart failure generally results in decreased stroke volume, which in turn reduces cardiac output. Signs and symptoms of heart failure depend on the type of heart failure and the side of heart that's affected. In left ventricular failure, blood backs up within the pulmonary circuit, resulting in pulmonary congestion or pleural effusion, i.e. fluid in the lungs. The backup of blood flow increases pressure in these vessels. The fluid is driven out of the pulmonary capillaries, resulting in pulmonary effusion or edema.